Hello, everyone. Um, welcome to another design talk for Super Studio 2021. Um, in this design talk, we are very welcome to have um, uh, Dr. Gary Preslin and Professor Mel Dodd. Um, the first presentation that um, we'll be going through is Gary's. We, and then after Gary's, um, we'll go through Mel's. Um, so I'll let Gary first um, introduce himself and let him jump into his uh, presentation. Uh, thank you, everyone. Um, you what? Can you hear me? Yep, we can hear you. Yeah, yeah. okay. Cool. Um, thank you, everyone, for that uh, introduction. I'll be very briefly about myself. I'm uh, an archeologist and historian uh, specializing in Indigenous culture, pre-European Indigenous culture, and the natural history of the Melbourne area. So I'll be speaking to you tonight about uh, the ways in which Indigenous people identified with their landscapes and the sorts of connections that they had with their landscape. Uh, and if you like, contrasting that with the view of the world uh, brought to Australia by the colonising Europeans from the middle of the, well, basically from 1835 uh, onwards. So if I share my screen, I think I've got Yeah, and Excellent. Okay. So, This is just a visual cue as to the kind of thing that I might be saying where we have on the, the left uh, typical scene of the days, uh, in this case, fishing uh, for indigenous people in Victoria and on the right, a uh, scene of what Europeans uh, came here to do, uh, plow, uh, farm sheep and cattle, etc. Okay, so I think the most appropriate way that I could begin is to, to acknowledge that I'm speaking to you from within the estate of the Wurundjeri Willem clan, uh, which is a part of the Kulin Nation. And I pay my respects to their elders past and present. Now, you may well have heard that or something like it uh, a number of times. And um, I could be absolutely certain in saying that I doubt very much whether the vast majority of people I speak to about these things knows exactly what the Kulin Nation is. And so I'm, I'm not going to start on a long dissertation about the Kulin and what it means, uh, because it would take up uh, probably the rest of the evening. But uh, what I will say here now is that the Kulin was composed of or comprised uh, six language groups that is six groups of people who spoke uh, different languages. All of those languages were related in some way. They were related to each other. They were similar. Uh, and the people, uh, the various language groups, were connected in a, in a variety of ways. Uh, this is a map which shows the extent of the, the Kulin uh, territory. So basically, that is it. Uh, it's split uh, for reasons to do with linguistics into two halves, uh, eastern and western, eastern half, Boonarong, Nwaiwurrung, Tongarong, Nagara, Ilamwurrung. I hope you're all taking notes because I'll be asking questions later. Jaojurong uh, and Watharong. Now, that's as much as I'm going to say about the Kulin, you can work out that clearly there's a similarity in the names of the language groups. So they are all, in fact, are wrong. But the essential thing is that uh, there is some common vocabulary. And one of the words that, perhaps the most important word that is common to all of these languages is the word kulin. And that means literally human being. So if you did not speak one of these languages, uh, that is to say you were not born in one, in one of these areas, then you were not a human being. Uh, we'll leave it at that. You can ask me questions later about this. Okay. 
Now, the the Woiwurrung, uh, the as I say, the Kulin was composed of of six uh, language groups. One of these was Woiwurrung, and within the Woiwurrung, there were five clans. The clan is the most important uh, level of organisation within the indigenous world. Um, Aboriginal people, I should say, probably at, at the beginning, um, I should say, if I can find my notes, so I can read it out. Um, that the, there is no meaningful distinction that can be made in traditional Aboriginal society, culture, between uh, people and their country. They are, in fact, indivisible. In the case of the Woiwurrung clans, these five named clans, the clans themselves, in all, all across Indigenous Australia, were named uh, in part to describe, to differentiate them from other clans, I guess, of course, but uh, also to describe the, the country in which people lived. So the current young bullock, for example, and you can see them down here uh, in the, on the western end of what is the Moiburung language group territory. The current young bullock, current young literally means bullock is people, and these are the people who live in an area of red earth. Kanamul and bullock live in an area of creeks up here in the foothills of the dividing range. Marin bullock live by the Mar close to the Maribyrnong River, big water. Wurundjeri Willem, people who live where white gum, that is to say smooth bark gums grow, and Balak Willem, these are two halves of a large, a large clan called Wurundjeri Balak. Uh, the Balak Willem are people who live, these are the Balak Willem here, who live in area with our wetlands. That's not to say they weren't wetlands in other areas. This is how they've identified themselves. So it's an indication of the way in which, if you like, they, one way they indicate their identity in terms of the place in which they were born, uh, in which they live. To give you uh, another indication, the, the different clan, sorry, different uh, language groups, uh, the territorial, sorry, I should say, the territorial boundaries of language groups are marked not by lines drawn on a map, but by the presence of a physical feature or some aspect of the natural landscape. For example, in the case of uh, Boonwurrung and Woiwurrung, this area up here, uh, where water streams tr drain into the Yarra, uh, you are on Woiwurrung territory. Where water drains into the bay or into Bass Strait, then you are in Boonwurrung territory. That's a simple rule that they have. That's it's an indication of where their boundaries are. In this ca case here specifically, the boundary between this particular clan, the Nara Willem clan of Boonwurrung speakers, and the Wurundjeri people on the other side, is Gardner's Creek. That is the line that they're, and Gardner's Creek goes off here, but the line is then extended down to and, and including the uh, southern extension of Boonwurrung, which is Wilson's Promontory. So once again, people are identifying with uh, some aspect of the nature of their country. Of course, it's not surprising that, um, well, I should say that uh, things such as identity and uh, perceptions of nature, understanding of nature are always culturally bound. So it, it is, uh, um, it's, it should be no surprise that um, uh, to find that the immigrants or colonial Europeans 
uh, who came in the 1830s from, which had a completely different worldview. And their worldview was one in which there was a perceived split, if you like, between humans and the rest of nature. They were seen as sep essentially sep separated from phys the physical world. And this rested, I think, on three intellectual streams that were part of the Western intellectual tradition. Firstly, there was the Bible. People were brought up with the Bible and the Bible gave, gave, told them what they had to do. And one of their, one of the injunctions was be fruitful and increase in number of people, fill the earth and subdue it, rule over fish and sea, etc. So this immediately gave many people a lot a license to to think that they were that humans were there to take charge of the world and do with it whatever they they particularly wanted and this to some extent uh, this sort of thinking was underlined by philosophical and technological developments beginning in the scientific revolution and then uh, continuing in during the enlightenment and pivotal in these movements in terms of the philosophical and the opinions of how people perceive the world was the work of Francis Bacon and René Descartes. Uh, and thirdly, the development of the capitalist system, uh, where elements of nature are appreciated for their monetary value rather than for their social worth. And to give some examples, so uh, people came, people came to Australia, came to Victoria, in, from the mid 1830s onwards, and they brought these attitudes with them. And the effect on the landscape uh, was widespread. And to give you a couple of examples of the sorts of things that European, the immigrant uh, colonists felt that they had licensed to do was to alter uh, any aspect of the landscape that they uh, felt needed to be improved. And, one could even see it as being improved, improving God's work. This is um, a lovely little watercolour of Batman's Hill. Uh, it's a feature of the landscape for which you will now look in vain because it has been completely removed uh, in two episodes of, uh, of engineering work, one in the 1850s and then one, the second in the 1890s for the purposes of basically connecting, in the latter case, connecting the Flinders Street railway station with what is now the southern, called the Southern Cross uh, railway station. Where the, the, this sort of alteration of the landscape was, was par for the course for the European colonists. Uh, and it's still going on today, of course. Uh, this is a, a relatively recent railway map and the area that I've I've shown here, <clears throat> excuse me, had uh, chose the course, a part of the course of the southeastern um, freeway or arterial freeway, as used to, the southeastern freeway, as the Houston calls now, the, the Monash. Um, and that follows the course of Gardner's Creek, that same Gardner's Creek, which was the boundary between Boonmarong people on, on the southern side here. And way more on people on this side. Uh, so they've, they've made use of these uh, streams such as um, Gardner's Creek, Kunung Creek, uh, Mooney Ponds Creek, all of these lovely uh, valleys which are now the, the uh, site of uh, freeways carrying uh, vehicles one way or the other. I think the probably the uh, the best example uh, that we have of the difference between the European views of landscape and, and uh, uh, connection to nature and, and those of the indigenous people of these areas, of the area of, say, Melbourne, is can be seen in the differing attitudes of either group had to uh, swamps, what we what were called swamps, what we would now call wetlands. This is an 1863 map, a chart of 
to the uh, top upper part of the bay, and this is of course where the, the settlement. This is less than uh, thirty years, slightly less than thirty years after European incursion into the area. The major feature of this landscape, of course, is this area here, which is uh, a very large wetland called uh, came to be called the swamp or West Melbourne swamp or sometimes uh, Batman swamp because it was close to where Batman's Hill was, which was just in here. Now this um, for Europeans, uh, they basically different uh, the different uh, groups, indigenous versus colonists, have different views of this. Uh, for the Europe, for the indigenous people of the area, the Kulin people uh, of, of the various language groups, that that wetland, I go back, that wetland presented one of the few uh, places within the Kulin world where major meetings could be held, held when where hundreds of people could gather. And, and be sustained uh, with the natural resources of the area over a matter of weeks. And meetings of this kind are an essential feature of the Indigenous way of life to make continued connections between what would otherwise be essentially uh, pretty far removed different groups of people. Because as I said at the beginning, all of the groups within the Kulin world are connected in various ways, including the intermarried and so these connections had to be maintained and they were once or twice a year there were major meetings uh, at places such as the uh, around the West Melbourne, what, what was called West Melbourne Swamp. Uh, so for the indigenous people of the Coolin world uh, this was a prized uh, area in terms of the resources that it made available that it made available for these meetings. And so people would come up from the Balloway Peninsula, they'd come from as far away as the Mon as Walton's Promontory, and they'd come down from across the other side of the Riding Range. And and it, each of these groups would have a particular site in which they would set up their, their camps around the Melbourne area. And over a space of a couple of weeks, they would be engaging in uh, ceremonies, in meetings, in discussion groups, there were probably occasions for uh, the exchange of um, marriage partners. Also probably uh, some initiation ceremonies going on for, for boys and girls who were of the appropriate age. Uh, so it was a, it was a major site in the uh, Coolan world. But of course, the Europeans had a completely different view of, it, of swamps generally. In, in a largely uh, agricultural society, swamps were of no particular value because they they couldn't be made use of. They couldn't plough them or, or be built upon. Moreover, uh, up until close to the end of the 19th century, uh, wetlands were thought of as being the source of disease. Uh, and the word malaria, for example, is literally mal area. It comes from the Italian uh, for bad air. It was thought that the air coming from wetlands was the source of disease. So you, uh, Europeans didn't think much of, of these areas at all. And so over a period of time, they set about uh, reclaiming it, starting uh, reclaiming West Melbourne Swamp. As they did with most of indeed all of the wetlands, the many wetlands around the Melbourne area. So over a period of time, these, uh, this wetland here began to, to disappear. And until today, what we have is a completely different, uh, perception, well, more than perception, a different world in this area. And it wasn't, of course, as you can see on this map, it wasn't just the wetland that was changed. The whole course of the river was in fact changed. This is this is the old course of the river up until 1883. This is where it flowed. This is where it now flows. Docks were built here. Firstly, in the uh, in the in the 1890s, and then here in the 1940s, and here 
in the 1960s. So this whole area was just completely uh, re reformed to suit the the interests of the Europeans. And I think I may well have run out of time, but I've, I've finished in any event. Uh, and questions are welcome. Thank you, Gary. Um, good presentation, very, um, uh, lots of relevant information. Parts of brief, you, you both provided a few of both aspects of the indigenous as well as the colonial, which is very relevant to the brief. And the, the presentation of your maps, I found was just very, I think it was a good visual to see how the land changes over time as different time of, say, different identities of different people mm -hmm. bring their own aspects, their own um, beliefs and ideas. And in turn, that, that kind of transforms the place as a result. Um, I'd like to um, leave up to participants. If you have any questions, um, please um, write them in the chat or you can open your mic um, and just ask the question. So it'll be good to hear. Um, in the meantime, while people are thinking or writing questions, I guess Gary will, in regards to the brief, um, you know, there's different groups such as the indigenous and colonial kind of um, aspects. And I was wondering what's your advice to people when to participants when they're engaging in those areas in, in relation to identity and place? Mm. Um, well, that's an interesting question, actually. Um, it's very difficult. I think that it's probably, I think the thing that I would, I would be looking for in terms of some, would be something uh, where in, in architectural terms, where the re a reference is made to the previous occupation of the area or previous history of the area so that, and to give you perhaps one example, so many years ago there was a major uh, architectural uh, project on the south bank of the Yarra, just uh, just downstream from the CBD, it was called the Mervac, Mervac development, where a series of high-rise uh, buildings, uh, apartments were put up and there was an attempt uh, at the time for uh, to create reference to the past uh, use of that area and occupation of the area through the uh, installation of uh, public art. And, and one of the outcomes of that was the web, the web bridge, which goes across the Yarra, it's a footbridge, but it has over its, its uh, covering, if you like, is in the shape of an eel trap, which uh, Aboriginal people would have made to capture eels in the river. So by the use of, of that design, it's, it's uh, there uh, making reference to the former presence and activities of, of Indigenous people in the area. Uh, so I think that sort of thing, you know, that that would be one way. I'm not sure about how it might be built into the architecture, but it's certainly in in terms of um, public art, for example, uh, you can do it more easily, I assume. Mm -hmm. And just um, building upon something you said from your presentation, you said when um, certain... Um, Please correct me if I'm wrong. When people are outside of a certain area, they're not considered human. Uh, <laughs> yes, that, that's, yes. a, well, that's a very kind of, um, you know, a heavy well, thing yes. to think about in terms of people, being a person, yeah. Yes. I, people within the Golden World we, uh, did recognize that there were beings uh, outside of, of the Golden uh, and that they, whilst they may uh, look like us uh, from the golden point of view, 
Um, they, they didn't speak our language. Uh, you could do business with them, and certainly trading uh, was carried on outside of the Coolum world, from the, within the Coolum to outside. You could do that, but you would certainly not marry them. Uh, mm. So, in a way, the Coolum was a, a self-enclosed uh, world where everybody uh, believed the same uh, things in, in terms of spiritual values. They intermarried and they uh, spoke related languages. Uh, and, they, and because they exchanged marriage partners, say between Tongarong people in, in the Goldwyn Valley, Goldwyn River Valley, and in the Yarra Valley, uh, a person and women went to live with their husbands. So the husband was a Tongarong man from up near Seymour, say. Uh, the, the young girl, the girl he married, was a Woiwurrung speaker, but he she had to speak Tongarong when she lived there because that was the language of that area. And you may think, well, how would she know? But her mother had come in the opposite direction. She was a Tongarong and she'd come a generation before. And so every person in Indigenous society grows up speaking at least two languages uh, within the Kulin world. And so that's how people are connected and that's how they uh, managed to be able to move around in that way. Yeah. But if you went to another, the other thing about it is if you went to into another uh, language group that wasn't part of the, into the territory of another uh, language group that wasn't part of the Kulin, you would not know how that landscape had been formed because a part of the connection that people have is through their understanding of the, the formative processes and acts that took place in the dreaming to form the landscape that they have. And they have songs about it. You must know about song lines. So as people go around, they sing the stories that tell the the tell of the creation of the world. But if you move to another, if you get, went into another person's territory and it wasn't part of the Kulin world, you would not know the stories. So you would feel very uncomfortable. Well, I guess, um, you know, to try and build upon that, when you have two identities clash with each other, yeah. do you believe that that creates conflict or does that create an opportunity for progression? Uh, but it, it, <laughs> uh, do you mean within the indigenous world or within our world? Within our our world. Oh, and... um, well, certainly in our world, I mean, because we, we think about these things in different ways. And when faced with a challenge, we often uh, think outside the square, I think is, is the expression that's used. And uh, uh, we think of ways of getting around it. And, and even to the extent of incorporating uh, that into our world. And perhaps if you wanted to go, wanted to see it in in uh, historical terms, in terms of the Kulin, people within 30 years were putting aside amenities that they had with other groups, say in Gippsland and marrying people from Gipsa and marrying people, they were marrying out. They were marrying people who were not Kulin because the numbers of, of Indigenous people had dropped dramatically through disease and and uh, the causes. And so they had to reorder their whole world and they did that. And they made, they turned themselves, for example, into, into farmers settled in one place uh, for the sake of being able to stay on country. It was the primary consideration for them was to stay on country. And, mm. and it was a lesser consideration that they could not uh, move around the country to maintain that, you know, care for country in the way that they used to, but they were still there and uh, making a living. So they're, they're extremely adaptable in that regard. Right. Well, thank you. Um, we're still waiting on some questions, so just find a few questions. Um, or you can raise your hand, um, ask, or just type them in. Um, but I'm if never, I'm never sure whether no questions is a good thing or not. 
<laughs> Don't worry, Gary. I think your presentation you know, explained a lot of um, relevant things um, to the brief um, and to the participants. So, Susan, did you put your? I think Susan. Yeah. <laughs> I think she's just saying hello. Yeah. Hello. <laughs> hello, Gary. Hello, I, was gonna, I wasn't going to let you go without a question. <laughs> there we go. <laughs> um, so it's not really a question, and I don't expect you to have, you know, the penultimate answer of any sort. But I, 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 I what I wanted to say was a uh, um, really valued, you know, a historical perspective, um, particularly from, from you. Uh, and someone who has been already in the field charting, mapping these things don't, it, it sounds so simple, the information and knowledge that you shared with us today, but no doubt it, you know, it wasn't simple to gather, it wasn't simple to piece together, etc. And so what I got from, you know, this today was that historically, you know, the connection of the people was, was really paramount. I mean, it, it was crucial. It, it was what gave them the identity and preserved the identity of each of these tribes you know, in the in the region, but today with all that erosion of um, um, uh, you know, the erosion of not only the the, the context of the, the the environmental context, but with the with the changing, you know, with the tr the transformation of of co connecting through a digital world, in a digital world, how do you think this affects you know? the ability to um, sustain or have the sustainability of, of, of people's identities and the communities of these different tribes? Well, uh, I think, you know, that um, I'd have to say that the Indigenous people in Australia are wonderfully adaptable. I mean, for instance, as I was saying a moment ago, they, they could, within 30 years, put aside their traditional ways of making a living and, and turn themselves into settled farmers. Likewise, I know a lot of Indigenous people here in, in the Melbourne area, a lot of Wurundjeri people, and they derive their, uh, they they base their identity uh, on the fact that they are connected to, and they can trace their descent back to people who lived on country through European times. And, and so they derive uh, comfort in that. And, and in some cases, uh, it's a bit difficult because uh, clearly many aspects of traditional Indigenous pre-European life have, have uh, not, uh, not any longer possible. But I do know people who uh, do will say at least that they have a totem as well. So they, uh, and this was something that everybody in pre-European times did. Have. So everybody had a totem which was sacred to them, an animal of some sort, of uh, some species. And so they, um, it would take me too long to explain why they would do this, but uh, but people nowadays still maintain that sort of thing. And I think they, because of their connection to country and because they, in in traditional Aboriginal, well, in, in Aboriginal families, oral tradition is a major influence. And so your parents have, spoken to you about these things as their parents did to them. Your grandparents, uh, if they're still uh, with us, are uh, uh, talking to them as well. And so they they do uh, get a whole range of perspectives uh, provided to them, which help them anchor to, to their own country and to maintain as much as is possible the, the sort of connection that their ancestors uh, would have had. And I think that, like like all other people, they they um, are adept at taking in new things and technology. You know, the, the internet and the digital world can be used just as easily by uh, Indigenous people in Australia as as any other people. They can make use of that, and they do. Thank you, Gary. That's right. That's the end of our um, discussion with Gary. So thank you, Gary, for sharing your presentation. We'll just move on now. Um, so our next speaker is Professor Mel Dodd, and I will let Mel introduce herself and um, present her presentation. 
thanks, uh, Aramel, and thanks to Gary. I really enjoyed that talk. It was super informative and um, good to hear before my own, probably uh, quite different, but with some uh, resonances. Um, so I'm going to introduce with some slides just because my approach to this talk was a little bit just to talk about what I do um, and maybe that seems the sort of most relevant way to draw perhaps some parallels to, to your um, the challenge within your competition brief, I suppose. And perhaps what I'm really talking about is some of the methods that I've used um, across my career. And so just to give you a sense, I'm an architect, but I have to say in the UK because I'm not registered in Australia. I'm an architect registered in the UK, so I'm a practitioner. Um, I've also been teaching for 20 years in schools of architecture and been head of architecture at a few institutions in London and um, Melbourne. And I also do research, which is through the mode of practice. So I have this interlinked um, role. And so as part of a, being a practitioner, certainly um, a while ago now, because now I'm a full time um, academic, I have done built projects. And maybe that's a good introduction just to what I'm interested in. Um, so this is a very early project that I ran, um, I ran as, a, as, a, as an architect in London. And by the way, it's been fantastic to be within um, the sort of uh, the, the indigenous um, language and cultural groups of Victoria and around Melbourne. Um, I'm taking you to London. Um, so very different context, but perhaps some lots of resonances in terms of how you work with um, contexts and cultures and understanding identity. So we're in London, um, but this project was a public realm project, so a public landscape project in um, London. And it was um, started in a way, a very interesting uh, question for me as an architect, um, a young architect, which is um, asked the question of in this case of public space, who's the client? Who, who, is the, who is the project for? Not for the person who pays, perhaps the local authority, but perhaps the, the sort of everyday person who is on the street. Um, and, and this has been a sort of constant um, through my career, which is how do we accommodate the sort of social and cultural um, invisible infrastructures uh, of society into built and physical infrastructures, meaning what's the relationship some uh, question came before to Gary, um, how can we understand these ephemeral infrastructures, rich cultures and social networks, social histories in physical spaces? And so that's been something I've been interested in. Um, if that was the final project, the, the research for the project, um, this is a map, because when I started my career, we drew things on paper, and so that's why it looks so crap. Um, this is a map and the black dots are um, the, the, the method of doing the project, which was to have many, many conversations with people public on the site. The project was for this big um, swathe of land, which is called Southwark Street, and it's in the London borough of um, Southwark. And um, we looked at having many conversations with people, passers-by, local community groups, school children, um, and this was setting, a, if you like, set a method, which I've worked with a lot through the rest of my career, both teaching and practice, that um, to capture the social and cultural context of a place, we need to talk to people and understand um, how we can incorporate people within the process of design. Um, it sounds simple, but perhaps um, not so simple in truth. Um, other projects that I've done, I'm just going to sort of whip through them maybe quickly and focus perhaps on the last one. But um, many projects have therefore been about making public space where the collaboration has been with the public um, in order to develop a project. This project was for a town square in Barking. Um, and what you see in front of you is a folly, um, which was built with local um, as, a, as a social art project with local apprentices at the Stonemasons College. It's a fake piece of history, a sort of memento mori of um, Barking Abbey, which was a ruin, reconstituted with local unemployed train training um, providers. 
And so this is really about how we might undertake architecture and make architecture in collaboration with people uh, and, and sort of exploring some of those stories, but um, maybe in this way, quite a, a sort of um, surreal way. Um, and the projects that, I, that I've carried out have been done in the context of a art and architecture practice, which is a practice called Muff in London, it's been established for about 25 years and you might know them if you don't you can look at the website but the projects were um, the practice consists of artists and architects working collaboratively and using socially engaged techniques so um, socially engaged is therefore a technique that involves us collaborating with people in the production of space um, and understanding um, the, the rich identities and cultures of a place and feeding that into a project um, and so, as, as I've said, in this case, working with local um, apprentices uh, to actually create ideas rather than creation just from the sort of mental space of an architect. Um, we've also, Muffer also um, curated the British Pavilion in Venice in 2010, um, which was another interesting project, which recreated a piece of a, the Olympic Stadium. That was the pre the London Olympics, but recreated it as a drawing studio, uh, built it in the pavilion as a joinery object, which was designed to be uh, then taken to a local school in Venice. Um, and, uh, and, and so effectively, this was a story about how the architecture Biennale, which is usually a glossy exhibition that's imported into Venice, could actually do some good in Venice and the Venice school children could benefit from a piece of infrastructure. Um, so uh, uh, that project, um, before I go on too much, I'm just gonna whip through to the last project because I think it's a good one um, to introduce the practice. And the, this project is called The Horse's Tail. It's um, again, a community space, a community garden. Um, this is a picture of some posters that were made with local secondary school children as part of the project. And the reason that these horses are on it is because the project was set in a social housing estate, um, actually on Swampland, uh, uh, north, on the north shore of the Thames in Thurrock. And um, the Swampland is usually a place where social housing is built, we find in cities because it's cheap land or otherwise, um, as, as Gary said, not utilised by, um, by Western sort of um, centric values. Um, so this swamp was built, had uh, industry and also social housing. And it was also um, very many, many horses in this area. And that's because the social housing was being um, used by or rather it was being utilized and lived in by a whole range of um, what, what's commonly known as um, Romanis or gypsies, meaning traveling people. So a very specific cultural um, group who tend to um, typically have been nomadic, but been obviously coming from Europe, um, moving around, but then settled. Um, so gypsies or Romanis have, traditionally have ponies. Um, that's, the, that's how they carry their... <laughs> carry their houses around. And so once settled in social housing in Thurrock, um, the, the, the horses were grazed on common land, um, just wasteland in the, the sort of marsh. And so the project really under, went into the detail about how, what makes, as this poster said, what makes a place feel like it's yours? Um, how can hidden social and cultural dimensions of a place like um, the use of uh, the, the fact that this place was, um, inhabited by many Romani um, cultures, somehow um, become the, the, the sort of focus of a project. And the project in this case was a park and we incorporated a dressage arena for the horses to, for the children to use with their horses. Um, and we also did a parade. Um, so the, the, we made posters, but we also made costumes. And this was about, um, again, a sort of socially engaged art project, which um, in collaboration with the design of the park, restated the importance of horses in the landscape based on the cultural uses of this particular um, set of people. So um, there's a book that is quite old now, that this is what we do. Um, and also in my own practice, I've also then written books further about how we can design with people. 
um, or how engaging with, with these other sort of dimensions, social and cultural dimensions within the city can form, um, you know, uh, a, a particular type of work. So, I mean, I guess the rest of my slides are really um, move forward just quickly into um, this idea of, of context, where context isn't just a physical context, it's also a cultural dimension. Um, and what I've done when I've moved into a university or educational setting um, is understand how we can continue to be as sensitive um, to working more broadly um, uh, in the university um, where context is important. And part of that is also about this idea, and I think this resonates in a, maybe in a tangential way with what Gary said, this idea that we might we need to learn experientially and sit in a situated way out in the world. Um, so learning is the process whereby knowledge is created through the transformation of experience. So I've become interested because I'm an educator in architectural education as something that we need to do in places and in sites and with people, not just in the university at our drawing boards. And so um, a lot of the work that I've done is, has, has built on this idea. And there are some of these quotes, um, this one from uh, Laban Benger called Situated Learning, is that um, we learn by participating in the world in a community of practice and um, that those practices of social communities construct identities in relation to community. So this is a constant way that we learn, reconstructing our identities as we learn and accommodating the identities of many others in the process, um, hopefully equipping us to be architects with a sort of um, a sensibility for the complex, rich sort of cultural um, layers that are in the contemporary city. Um, and some of that uh, idea of learning is taken very seriously by uh, to extreme. So Paulo Freire, who's a Brazilian educator, has written a really interesting book called Pedagogy of the Oppressed, which is that education is not about being taught something, but somehow um, being uh, not in a hierarchical relationship, but being um, with others. Um, so those are just some conceptual principles about how we might learn in different ways if, and how we might learn architecture in different ways. Um, and some of the projects that I've done within those frameworks with students have um, thought about that through materials, um, as well as through social and community groups, um, as well as through the student themselves discovering their own identity as part of a project. Um, this is a project that was for the Lake District in, in England. Um, it was a, it was a, a oven, um, an external oven for a site that was a build project. So we did a live build um, and one of, and it was paired with this project, which was a, 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 a pavilion for um, close by again in the Lake District. Um, and both of these projects looked at the materiality as a way to connect with the cultural landscape. So copper mines are um, prevalent in the Lake District on the site. And um, so this project both took copper as a, as a sort of material to start to play with and also took community with it. So what you see in this project is um, copper shaped through crafting workshops with local children. Again, um, understanding how both referring back to cultures in history in the past and thinking forward and working with school children, we can sort of start to stretch these meanings across um, materials. So this is not just about ephemeral activities, but also about how we choose materials. Um, so that that oven was uh, and the project was was went forward and was um, other projects in its wake included things like reconstructing buildings almost archaeologically. So this was the Watts Chapel. It's a historic arts and crafts chapel in the south of England. And one of the build projects was literally about going and reconstructing it at scale um, in order to explore some of the cultural resonances of what um, the arts and crafts movement meant because the Watts Chapel was built um, as part of a social movement um, and uh, was very much about how craft was important to everyday life. So building and making is one part of the projects that I've done as an educator. And sometimes that's meant that students have built with their own hands um, and understood materials, insights and contexts and the meanings of those. And that's also involved us thinking about the future, the sustainability of materials. So this particular project is about exploring hemp um, as a material and making those projects. And some of the projects that we've done in, in, in 
in the sort of teaching that I've carried out has also um, then asked students to um, do their own uh, independent projects and work with communities to support communities. So this is a project um, that two students collaborated to do in London, which was um, work with a, a, a community group trying to resurrect some old buildings to form a community cafe and a workshop. Um, this, these students um, went out, they did a, a crowdfunding, um, they produced drawings, this was all part of their final year project. Um, and by working with the community, they um, managed to get really quite a large amount of money pledged um, and have gone forward and graduated and actually built this project with the community. So uh, again, this sense that university isn't a place where you study how to work in the world, it's where you actually work in the world with people um, and, and, and supporting, if you like, how communities might um, be able to thrive. Uh, and another similar sort of project, this one's in South London, again, an, a student in their final year working with a community group, trying to build a community garden, um, very making very simple interim sorts of shelter, um, using the labour and the resources that they have as a final year student to actually um, facilitate uh, a particular group's um, development of a park and a social space. And uh, another example of final year students, this time even looking further into their own experiences in London as students, um, how much uh, rent they have to pay, how difficult it is to live in a contemporary world, and using those subjects in their own work, so reflecting very much on their own um, quandaries and troubles as individuals, so that their own identity, it's not others' identity they're trying to work with, but their own identity and their own um, troubles. These students formed a sort of uh, group. They went on marches that was, um, uh, there were lots of um, protests in this uh, year about housing costs and housing crisis. And um, the student whose final project it was then proceeded to do a project which looked at different ways of affordable housing, continuing to use the idea of protest and banners as, as ways that she talked about her work. Um, I think I'm going to draw it to a close and I've got a few more slides. So I guess, um, including some international projects. So I guess, um, in conclusion, the, the work is um, partly about how uh, taking an initial idea in practice that is about socially engaged or relational um, working with communities into a university or an educational setting, um, not losing or allowing a gap to be made between learning and engagement in the world, but really um, keeping that going. And the last few slides are just bigger projects that, um, that we've run with students where we've been commissioned to do community projects and really seen the university as a place to develop projects with local communities um, uh, and, and almost as a sort of form of um, consultancy. So I think um, maybe in conclusion, I guess very different sort of um, type of uh, work I'm showing you to the sorts of things that Gary talked about. So I imagine your heads are exploding, um, but I'm hoping that it's making some sense in relationship to how the methods um, that we can use as architects, the way we can engage with um, particular communities particular identities and particular cultural contexts and be more sensitive um, to that. And maybe it's useful for the projects that you're doing um, this week. Thanks. Great. Uh, thank you, Mel, for your presentation. Um, very good insight. Um, it's good that you shared your journey and your experience in those. Um, a lot of projects from that you've personally experienced the process of it being built. So I guess moving on to the Q and A, um, as the same with Gary, it's good. If you all have a question, type in the chat or um, raise your hand, open your mic and, and speak. Um, this is really a good opportunity for you all as participants to um, get the opinion and get ideas from the speakers we've invited. I guess to start, um, just off the question, I guess, Mel, um, how, since, you know, you, you've been a practitioner, you've been an educator, how important do you think it is for students to recognize their own identity before they proceed to 
you know, you said construct identities for communities. I think it's really important and probably something we don't do very well in architectural education because we see ourselves as sort of professionals that set a set apart that can be offer a service, but failing to realise that we're 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 a part of a, a part of a group rather than um, on the outside of a group. So um, I think that's certainly something that I've um, seen as more and more important is to allow students to be comfortable with their own approaches. Um, to space their own cultural identity and what they bring with them into architecture school rather than to assume that architecture is a thing that you get better at rather to sort of to find the the the, the approach from within you and then to learn skills uh, as you go that allow you to to start to um, bring that into your work and I think by doing that we might develop um, practitioners who are more sensitive to how um, they need to understand their clients. I think architecture's had a very big metamorphosis in the last sort of 30 to 50 years from perhaps the modern movement where there was perhaps a lot of a sense of um, experts trying to improve the health and well-being of um, communities, um, you know, very laudable attempts to make social housing and schools and health centres that would, would really help. But um, unfortunately, this sort of um, slightly uh, the expert on, on from a distance, the, the you know, the, the planner in the helicopter from above, as opposed to somebody who's able to understand themselves as part of a community. Um, so I think um, we're getting much better at that. And it's certainly, um, but we've certainly got a way to go. Definitely. Um, yeah, that was a that was a good um, answer. Yeah, and then. And excuse me, I got a question, Maya. Yep, I was gonna go to yeah. Antonia had her hand yeah. up, so Antonia, go ahead. Uh, all right, thank you for the lecture. It's really uh, inspiring. So I got uh, one of the slides you showed us, which is about a context, which is very interesting. Um, from an architecture view, I think for architects or studios or students, with lots of stuff to the local community is kind of part of the local identity. But I want to ask, do you have some thoughts or what's your interpretation about how different location or local community influence individual, how they recognize their own individual identity? So, so how, how, low, how communities can do that? Uh, how, can, how can they um, just say uh, that one? I yeah, sure. <laughs> like from an architecture view, how different local community influence individual identity. For example, last year, lots of people come back, can't go back to their home and they have to have it wherever they were. And it's kind of, they have a different identity, people starting to recognize themselves with something else instead of where it come from, which language they speak. Mm -hmm. And some of them, just to recognize as mom or different roles. So that's my thoughts or questions about it. How local community put some influence on individuals' self-identity from an architecture view. Mm. Am I clear? Uh, yeah, I think so. It's quite a big question, so I might struggle with that one. Um, I think I think I I think I know what you mean. I mean, I guess. Um, I guess the, the it goes a little bit to a question that Gary answered about um, you know our identities are so complex now because cont the contemporary world is sort of you know information overload and we are sort of so well travelled and you know as many of you have probably come from overseas to study um, uh, you know our world is a sort of um, no longer in the compartmentalised um, perhaps um, earlier. Uh, cultural milieu in which we sat in different areas. So I think this, um, I think that we've developed new ways to form communities on the on the go. Mm -hmm. And sometimes those are things like the way we join clubs. Um, mm -hmm. We form we form small groups that build around you know sport or common interests. Or um, mm -hmm. and I think um, those those sorts. So, so in a way, it's not all downhill when we lose our sense of our own cultural identity. That's very mm -hmm. clear because we've lived here all our lives. 
It's yep. more about how we can form communities on the go and see ourselves as part of maybe 10 different communities and mm -hmm. be okay with that. So I, I suppose I've always been interested in working with, with those sorts of groups, whether it's um, you know, a theatre group or a particular sort of chess club or mm. um, a, a mother's group. They're always really interesting groups because they're little sub-communities, but it doesn't mean everything. They're not, that's not their whole life, but it's a way of which they can develop relationships that are supportive, um, but also, um, you know, form part of their, their, their sort of identity. So does that, does that answer? Yeah, I think so. Quite inspiring. So I would say maybe digital or virtual world influence our individual and that anymore instead of what we had before. Thank you yeah. so much. Thanks. Thanks, Antonia, for the question. Um, we're still open to discussion. So if you have any more questions, five questions, just rhyme chat or you can use your mic. Um, I guess doing one up. We got one from Wei. Yeah. No, I just I just thought that the discussion that you have about uh, you no know, practice and academia and the blurring of both is quite interesting. Like in practice, what we what we have is always a, a gap in knowledge knowledge about you know what's going on out there in the world, and there's always a disconnect between. You know the uh you no know, within the practice world where research being part of the practice become a challenge financially of how to sustain it, and sometimes I think you know the 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 advantage of being uh, blurring, uh being able to blur between academia and practice and practice and academia actually does help to create uh, you know the the knowledge flux and or transfer between both parties, and that literally deals with uh, the complexity of the society that we are you no know, it, it's also part of the complexity of society we are dealing with in the sense that you no know, apart from this um this uh, exchange that could be going you no know, the the interesting thing is um, you no know, based on the theme of evolving identity for example well are there any ways that uh, the students can think about or you no know, are there any advice that you you could give to the students in trying to Know, find a way of bridging uh, the gap of uh, knowledge and representation. And right, right, likewise, uh, while doing representation, how do you uh, know, uh, amplify the buoyancies of what your messaging is about and stuff like that? You know, it, it's, it'll be interesting to hear from a perspective as well. I mean, again, I, I've got one answer. It's probably, there's probably a few answers. But one thing that strikes me when you ask that is, and maybe it's a clue for students, uh, for all of you doing this competition this week, is sometimes it's good to take the representational um, languages or the languages of communication of the group, of a group that you might be thinking about or that you're part of and use them instead of languages that are generic, like drawing in plan or doing a rhino <laughs> model. So I guess what I mean by that is, and a good example is maybe reference to, to Gary's an archaeologist. One of the things we've done sometimes is work with the language of archaeology um, in terms of understanding um, objects in a lot of detail, um, drawing them and representing them really clearly and, and, and using that sort of forensic quality to extract information, which is one of, you know, uh, and another discipline um, so, so might have a very different sort of drawing technique. So, for example, music or choreography, they draw what they do in a totally different way. I think it's fun and sometimes very revealing to draw projects through a different lens um, using different languages. And it goes a little bit again to Gary's talk about language groups um, because, you know, our language and our medium of communication has got a relationship to our identity, our personal identity. Um, but we can also experiment with that and understand different languages that we can draw on as, our, as, as practitioners who work with drawing uh, as a tool to explain ourselves and to try to communicate with other people. Um, yeah, that's, that's, that's one thought. Suggestion, suggestion. <laughs> Uh, 
Great. And I guess, uh, okay. Aram, I'll just add one more thing, which is, I guess, uh, you no, know, that's the that's part of the beauty of why we have organized quite a wide uh, multidisciplinary uh, speakers to be part of this event. You know, cause the you know the 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 reality of what we have to be dealing with is in fact more complicated than what we can see or appreciate. There's many undercurrent uh, of uh, politics and whatnot to you know help us make certain decisions about what we do and, and stuff like that. So like, let's say for, for Gary, you know, he have, you know, he have used a mapping technique to visually represent the words that he's trying to speak. So likewise, I think, you know, the part of the lesson learned through Gary is about, you know, the, the form of uh, graphic representation to talk about, you know, the, the, the event or certain observations that you wish to, you know, uh, communicate. And I think that's the power of uh, architects in the sense that you know, we basically look through, we literally cut through the complexity to come up with a representation. And we tend to be a spatial thinker in able to develop spatial narrative to help people to visualize what those uh, you no know, thinking are. And likewise, you know, with, uh, with Mel, you know, the engagement of a community and whatnot and translating that into uh, events is also another aspect of what uh, we could do apart from building architecture, because sometimes, you no, know, apart from the hardware, the software is equally as important. And how do we come to terms to you know, enable that is an art that is actually quite interesting as a, as a way of uh, you know, uh, designing or, 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 or practicing or, or, or in fact thinking about uh, our, you know, our spatial world. Great. Thank you, Wei. Um, we had one more question. I saw someone's hand raised. It was Benjamin Greek? Yep. So Benjamin, would you like to share your question? That'll be our last question. Sure. Uh, can you hear me clearly? Yes. Okay, great. Um, thanks everyone so far. Super Studio, I'm one of the mentors and it's been great to follow the varied insights from uh, the creative direction uh, and also the multitude of speakers. What's interesting today and following on from what we've seen previously is um, thank you, Gary, for your cartography and layering and um, um, making people understand that, you know, things aren't always off face value. There are, there's a whole broader context and ecology um, that's not just about objects in space. And Mel, I appreciate um, the contrasting presentation that uh, shows small additive uh, projects that are, I, from what I can see, temporal in nature, uh, with an emphasis on building relationships. Um, I think it's good to show those things um, to the students, that there are many diverse uh, interpretations of architecture and how we can investigate or interrogate space. Um, now, in terms of um, the question, because I digress, um, I just want to clarify, and I guess this is an open question, can, can students, may, I'm just wary because Super Studio, having done it myself years ago, uh, <laughs> it can be quite an undertaking, and some students may fall into the trap of doing a grand gesture, and I think Showing these maps and uh, showing these small follies are a great uh, demonstration of how to be very articulate in doing a small gesture or, or maybe uh, not even doing anything at all and whether or not there is value in that. So do the students, the question is, do the students have to propose an object or an or a form of architecture that's represented as a space, or could they potentially um, use what's already there, um, already what they identify with, and potentially like a surgeon, just know where to make one incision, and then that adds value or that creates a better relationship? Sorry, it's heavily loaded. No, no, I guess that's a question. Um, I'm happy me. for anyone to jump in. <laughs> um, I guess from a um, 
you know, from a view from someone who helped organize the competition, Super Studio is a conceptual response. There are no kind of limitations to how far the student wants to go or how little they want to go. But Benjamin, you made an excellent point saying, you know, these small gestures, even that can be enough um, to convey an idea. And so maybe that's something that students um, just can think about and should think about. Um, so I can't really kind of say on behalf of the students saying that the proposal has to be something that's fixed. There has to be something, um, you know, it's physical, special. That's something that the students are to propose. And that comes down to what is important to them and how they want to show them, how do they want to convey that. Um, so hopefully, yeah, uh, to all the participants, it's up to you. It's your, it's your, it's it's your voice that you're trying to convey through what you're designing, what you're developing, what you're making. So hopefully, yeah, Benjamin, that kind of answers your question. Yeah, I guess it, it wasn't really a question. It was just a sort of <laughs> a, a bit of prose. Um, and a bit of caution to students not to overwhelm themselves. Enjoy Super Studio. It's a fantastic opportunity. Uh, $3,000 is not the end goal. The end goal is the experience and, and the relationships you're going to form during this, you know, this opportunity. Definitely. And, yeah, Benjamin, I just want to say thank you as well. You know, hearing from a mentor um, and hearing your um, your perspective, like, it's very relevant and it's a good lesson for all students. Um, yeah, it's been a while. <laughs> it's been a while. Yeah. <laughs> well, yeah, maybe get to now we're um, thanks, Benjamin, for your question. Um, Thank you. Now we're closing to the end. But yeah, um, just a reminder. Yeah, it's it's the process that makes the experience of this competition. So I guess um, on the end, I just like to say there's um in the chat I just shared the link to where the talks are being published. There's already the pre-recorded talks um, that have been um, published. So I encourage all participants to look at them and to take notes, learn something from it so they can help with the development of their um, of a design proposal for competition. Um, but other than that, I just like to say to Gary and Mel on behalf of the Australian Institute of Architects on the great team, just like to say thank you very much for your time and for sharing your knowledge with us um, today.